Good morning, Apollo Baptist Church. It is Monday morning. It is October the 12th. And our reading plan for this week is 2 Samuel chapters 19, 20, and 21. Uh, last week, you will remember that David... Uh, and his son Absalom uh, were at odds. That's putting it mildly. Absalom was trying to take over the throne and um, had an all-out rebellion against his father. And it was one of the saddest, most difficult times in the life of David. David's armies went up against Absalom and his armies, and Absalom was killed. David's son was killed. David's heart was just absolutely broken. Well, in the reading plan for this week, uh, David is back on the throne, uh, reorganizing, setting some things straight that, that were not right. And he is expressing it, godly gentleness and uh, care uh, for people. And... Um, and so he's, he's getting things back in, in line again. Uh, we come to chapter 21, and it's interesting because uh, it starts off by saying, Now there was a famine in the days of David for three years, year after year. And David sought the presence of the Lord. And the Lord said, It is for Saul and his bloody house because he put the Gibeonites to death. So there was a famine, and it went on year after year after year. And in the Old Testament, God oftentimes chastised his people through uh, famines and those kinds of things. And so David sought God. He said, God, what's going on? And God shared with him, uh, it's because of what... King Saul did to the Gibeonites that this famine is happening. The reason I'm chastising you is because of something Saul did. Now, Saul's been dead um, for quite a while. Um, and so that tells you something about God. Time does not necessarily fix our problems. They need to be addressed. And uh, it hadn't been. Well, who are the Gibeonites, Ex excuse me? Uh, well, they were not Israelites, but they had a covenant relationship with the Israelites. Back in Joshua chapter 9, when Joshua was leading the people of God to uh, drive out uh, the uh, foreigners that were there, and you think, oh, how awful, God's just driving people away. No, God gave them over 400 years to get their hearts right, and they rebelled against God because they had a hard, rebellious heart, and God finally said, enough, and his people moved in, and they righteously drove the other people out. Well, the Gibeonites were one of those people. Uh, they were technically Canaanites. They were Amorites, which was a part of the Canaanites. They were part of the people of Cana, the promised land. And they realized, we're up against the living God, and we're going to get wiped out. So the Gibeonites, you can read about it in Joshua chapter 9. The Gibeonites tricked Joshua. They dressed up like they were... Um, from a long, faraway land, and they had heard about God, and they wanted to join with Joshua and, and honoring their God, and Joshua didn't pray. That was interesting, one of the problems he did in that moment, he didn't pray about it. And he made a covenant with the Gibeonites, only to find out a few days later they had lied to him big time. They were from that area in the land of Canaan, they were Canaanites, and they tricked Joshua into making a covenant with them. Well, guess what? 
God did not let them break that covenant. He said, you've made that covenant, you will keep it, uh, and um, they will be a part of my people. And you can make them your slaves, you can give them duties to do. They were woodcutters for the sacrifice. Uh, not a bad job, actually, because uh, they got to be close to the major part of God's work. But nonetheless, they were to not be annihilated. Well, King Saul wiped them out, or at least tried to. And God said, we don't do it that way. Now, you and I need to learn from this. Sometimes God tells us what is right, and we learn from that. That's good. God's truth. But sometimes we see what is right because of something God did. And this is one of those times. God sent a famine on the land of Israel. Why? Because the people of Israel under Saul's rule had tried to annihilate a people with whom God's people had made a covenant. And God said, we don't do it that way. You see, our God is a covenant-making, covenant-keeping God. The idea that he's covenant-making, he makes promises. The idea that he's covenant-keeping, he keeps his promises. One of the basic attributes of our God is he does not lie. And he will keep his promises absolutely without any exception. And you see, the people of God said under Saul, ah, we can get rid of him. Saul wasn't thinking, which was unfortunately characteristic of him. But God was thinking, and God said, we don't do it that way. Now, you and I need to rejoice because God is our covenant-keeping God. He will never break his promise. Now, what that means is, for you and me, you and I shouldn't either. Uh, you make a promise, uh, you better make sure that you are serious, because God will expect you to make that, keep that. Now, not all promises are have the deep covenantal characteristics of God's people in Israel. I know that. But nonetheless, our word is a precious thing, and God wants you to keep promises. Because why? God is a covenant-making, covenant-keeping God. I hope you have a great week. Francis and I will be on vacation starting tomorrow, Tuesday, through the following Tuesday. So, uh, pray for us. We'll be praying for you. Uh, we'll be out of uh, town uh, and so um, we won't be there on Sunday um, if everything works out like we are hoping it will. So we'll be down on the beach uh, in the San Diego area, walking, wading through the uh, ocean water about up to ankle height. Uh, that's about as far as we get in. Uh, but we're looking forward to that. But you have a good week. Love you guys. Bye.